Hello, everyone. Welcome. This is our very first Naturalist Night of 2022. So welcome on in and thank you for joining us. Tonight, I am here with Maria Korchmaros. She is a survivor of a white shark attack. Um, and so she's going to be telling us a little bit about her story. And, uh, and then we're going to be hearing a little bit about shark stewards because her story kind of inspired her to get more involved in shark conservation. Um, we're going to wait a couple of minutes to see if David McGuire is able to join us. David is the founder of Shark Stewards, which is an ocean health and shark conservation organization. Um, and he had another event tonight, so he's running a little bit behind schedule. We're just going to see if he's able to pop in. And if not, we will be handing it over to Maria. So thank you for bearing with us. While we're waiting for David, I'd like to let you all know that uh, next month for our Naturalist Night, we will be having two speakers from a local organization, Orange County Climate Action Coalition. And that event will be on the second Thursday of April. So stay tuned for more information about that. I will be posting it to Eventbrite um, probably tomorrow. So uh, in a follow-up email to this event, you will all receive that link. So you can check that one out as well. And I hope you'll join us again. Hello everybody, it's Maria Kuchmaros here. Um, unfortunately, David is in that area where he doesn't have a really good signal and he's on his way to the Ocean Film Festival in Northern California. Um, he is a part of that organization as well. He volunteers to host that Ocean Film Festival in San Francisco every year. So that was his conflict today. They told him Monday that he needed to be at a very important meeting about sponsorships and setup and all the films that are gonna be hosted at that meeting. So unfortunately, he's gonna try and pop in a little bit later. So I'm gonna go ahead and start, uh, if you don't mind. And um, uh, first I wanna say thank you, thank you very much to Hillary at the Newport Back Bay Conservancy. And uh, we met at a beach cleanup one afternoon. And I said, uh, Hillary, hey, would you guys do talks about uh, nonprofits and, and conservation groups? And she said, yes, we do. So we were able to hook up and, and say hi. So uh, thank you, Hillary, for having us here and uh, looking forward to telling everybody about Shark Stewards and my uh, short little story. So just give me a moment, I'm gonna share my screen. Are we all up there, Hillary? All right, cool. All right, so welcome everybody. My name is Maria Korchmaros, and this is Shark Stewards. We uh, are an international nonprofit based in California, and we're dedicated to saving sharks and ocean habitats for all ocean life. Through lobby efforts, citizen science projects, beach cleanups, and educating youth about sharks, conservation, and healthy ocean ecosystems. David McGuire unfortunately wasn't able to be here. He's our founder and director. And he leads many of our lobby efforts, our conservation efforts. He has citizen science project that he works with a, a lot of people out of uh, Northern California, especially with Berkeley. Uh, he is an adjunct professor there and a marine biologist. So he has a, a group of students there that he works with. And we also do education programs and many other programs internationally with our partners in Hawaii, in Indonesia, in Malaysia, and here at home in the USA. So my name is Maria Kurtzmaus. As I said, I was kissed by a shark in 2016 on May 29th, which was Memorial Day weekend. Uh, I was swimming in the ocean and shortly after my incident, I met David and I found purpose through advocacy and working with David. So now I'm the Southern California chair of Shark Stewards. And um, this is my tattoo I got about four years ago. And, and that's my cool little hat. It says, come to the shark side. It's my uh, 
little Star Trek one off. And um, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about my incident. So hopefully I didn't add the gory pictures in, Hillary, just because I didn't want anybody to be freaked out. But the next one is my location on where I was bit. So this is the date of my incident and a little map from my phone, not from my phone, actually from my watch that I was wearing at the time. So on Memorial Day weekend, May 29th, it was a Sunday. I came there late in the afternoon to do a swim and I was training for a half Ironman distance triathlon. So my swim that day was supposed to be about a mile and it was gonna be 30 to 40 minutes in the ocean, lapping back and forth along the buoy line. So as you can see that little red line, is where I started on the beach and I came out to the buoy line there at Corona Del Mar State Beach. My family came with me, my husband and my younger son, my youngest son, he was 16 at the time with his girlfriend. So they were playing in the waves as I went out to swim and I just told them, listen, I'm just gonna go out for a swim and it just be a little bit a while. It was about three o'clock in the afternoon and the water was beautiful. It was nice, not really calm, but good. Uh, it's about a 200 yard swim to the buoy line, which takes me about five minutes. So I did notice that my watch, I couldn't really see my watch from a distance on my arm. So the water was kind of murky. But the other interesting fact was that I saw a lifeguard boat there. And normally a lifeguard boat isn't there. So I felt a little bit more comfortable being the only one in the water to see a lifeguard boat there. Even though Memorial Day weekend, there is over a thousand people on the beach. So I started off on my swim and about 10 minutes into my swim, I felt this piercing pain in my whole body. And I thought to myself, oh my gosh, my coach was right. I just got bit by a shark. So being a camper uh, and a longtime nature enthusiast, I thought to myself, you know, you better call for help. You better tread water and call for help because the boat is there and they can pick you up. So I treaded water, I called for help. So imagine my arms flailing in the air, treading water, screaming at the top of my lungs, get me out, get me out. And that's all I could say over and over in my head. So all of a sudden I see the lifeguard boat and I feel these arms or these hands pulling me up and out of the water. And I knew I was safe. So later when I was in the hospital, I actually talked to the lifeguards about this and they said to me, as they approached me, they thought I had a cramp in my leg, which often happens to swimmers and scuba divers and things like that. So I thought, okay. And then they said, as we approached you, the water was flat around you and there was bubbles coming up around you in a circle and you were in the dead center. And then as we approached you and we got closer, we saw the blood in the water and the water was stained red. And I thought, oh my goodness, what a horrible way to like approach somebody, right? So anyway, as they got me on board, I immediately said to them, my chest, my chest, I can't breathe. You got to check my chest. But Andy, my lifeguard, he had said, no, your chest is my main concern. Your arm is my main concern. I have to put a tourniquet on your arm. And at that point, I felt this warm gushing stuff coming out of my arm. So I immediately did what I was told. And Andy has said, you got to hold this until I tell you to let go. So I put my hand on, on my arm and as I felt my arm go numb, I let go. And then Andy said to me, listen, I've got to turn you over. I've got to check your injuries. What's your name? How old are you? And is there anyone on the beach? So I told him my, my, my name. I was 52 years old at the time. Maria Kuchmaraz, my husband's on the beach. My son's on the beach with his girlfriend. What are their names? I told him their names. So as this is all happening, the uh, the lifeguard, the driver, Mike, is driving around the jetty into the Balboa Coast Guard. So that's that red line, that big little loop there into the channel. So I'm gonna just pump us forward. And these are some pictures of my injuries. So these are my injuries. And as you can see, they're pretty horrific. Um, my arm in the middle there is my right tricep. It was basically ripped right off down to the bone and it was hanging from my elbow there. So they had to reattach my tricep. The one on the far right is my chest and my abdominal region. And the bite mark actually hit the middle of my chest. 
which is in the top area by the hand there. And then the bottom area around my belly button is where they had to go in and check my organs to make sure that my organs were still intact and that there was no teeth inside me. Because a shark's mouth is very, very dirty and they wanted to make sure I wasn't gonna get any infection. So, and then the rear picture on the far left, if you're looking at your screen the way I am, of my back, that is where the major damage happens. So the upper part of my back is a bite mark. And if you saw the pictures before surgery, you would see teeth marks all along my back there and all along the bottom of my hip area. So I tell people I was bit like a hamburger. The shark came up and got me dead center. And because a shark can open his mouth and unhinge his jaw, it was able to fit a lot of my body into its mouth. And then it bit down twice in five seconds. So I actually got two bites in five seconds and then it let go and it dove back down into the ocean. So I didn't know this until later, obviously talking to shark people like Chris Lowe. And so I'm gonna advance it forward. So this is Chris Lowe. He is a marine biologist and he runs the program over there at Cal State Long Beach. It's called the Shark Lab. And he has students come in and they do uh, a whole ton of studies on different animals. And he's the only one of the only universities that can do catch and release. So he actually goes out, he will catch a baby shark, they'll study it, they'll do studies on it, and then they'll let it go. He also tags great whites. So he's been tagging great whites on the Southern, Southern California coastline for about 20 years or more. So he knows a lot, he knows a lot about the sharks along the Southern California coastline. And luckily my husband was given my wetsuit. So they cut my wetsuit off in the ambulance. They also cut my bathing suit off in the ambulance to still, to stabilize me and to just check my injuries. So I was actually conscious all the way to the hospital. And the last thing I remember is the nurse taking off my earrings and my rings. And I basically said to her, you know, I really want to be put to sleep because I want you to fix me and get me all better. And she said, don't worry, darling, we're just going to prepare you for surgery. So Chris Lowe came about maybe five days after my incident and he took DNA off my wetsuit. And he determined that it was eight to 10 foot great white shark. So bear in mind that an eight to 10 foot great white shark is a juvenile and a juvenile of about maybe eight years old. So if any of you know of any children or grandchildren about eight years old, you know, they're pretty sprightly and they're still kind of figuring out life, right? So this shark was still figuring out life and it was still figuring out what to eat, what not to eat. And from 30 feet below at the Corinna del Mar buoy line there, when the tide is in, it's about 30 feet. It looked up and I was in a black wetsuit, mostly black, with the sun shining down at me. It was about 4.30, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. I was already maybe 10 or 15 minutes into my swim. Um, so probably closer to four, but I looked like a seal. So basically the shark said seal, much like a dog, dog would say squirrel. And it just approached me at 20 miles per hour, 10 to 20 miles per hour and took a big old bite. And my surgeon said, because it hit my pelvis and my rib cage, that it probably let go because those are the hardest bones in my body. And it basically said to itself, that's not a seal. That's not a fish. I can't eat that. So it let me go. But I, I and I agree with that after meeting David and Chris Lowe and Ralph Collier, who has a 50 year study in the whole United States and around the world. Because after learning more about sharks and talking with David, the number one reason why people get attacked is because it's either a predation incident, a mistaken identity, or they're vying for territory. So it's a territorial thing, but mostly it's because they're learning. And one of the issues we have in Southern California right now is that there's a lot more juvenile sharks down our way because of the warming waters with climate change and the mamas from the Farallon Islands up in San Francisco where David is now with the Ocean Film Festival um, and the Guadalupe Islands, they come here to pop because the food is plenty, 
the waters are warm, and who wouldn't want to eat at a buffet rather than searching the ocean 5,000 miles for something to eat? Um, I'm sure a lot of you would agree with that. So we have plenty of fish. We have plenty of seals because seals have been protected for over 20 years. So even though I got bit by a shark, I don't blame the shark at all because I'm in his territory. I'm in his, his house and I was just a visitor. So my thing is, you know what? I'd rather learn more about sharks and find out what exactly why they're there and, and learn why, how I can coexist with them rather than going and killing them all. So on that note, I'm gonna bump us forward. And this is David McGuire with my son, Lucas and myself. And this is in Las Vegas in December that, that year. So that's about six months after my incident. Um, I was out of the hospital in about nine days, and the doctors basically said to me, because I was strong going in and healthy, training for a triathlon, I was able to get out of the hospital pretty quick. I was determined to actually get myself back in shape and to do another triathlon and to get myself back into my normal uh, mode of operation, you know, my normal day. So I got back to training about three months later and I did my next triathlon in October that year in Mission Bay, San Diego. And it was a lot of fun. And then in, uh, along the way, I met David and he invited us to Las Vegas to make posters and vie against the shark fin trade. So he was doing a lobby effort to have a shark fin trade ban. So the shark fin trade is the random killing of over 100 million sharks just for their fins for a rich man's soup. So we went to Las Vegas, we made some signs and we went to Lush Cosmetics, who is one of his sponsors in their store there at the fashion um, mall and much like Fashion Island. And we lobbied against the shark fin trade and we got signatures and Lush Cosmetics actually has a charity pot with Shark Steward's name on it. So it was a pretty cool event. We had a lot of fun. And um, that's when I kind of decided that Shark Steward's was a cool nonprofit. It was a place where I could find some information about sharks. And my son is a diver. So I wanted to set a good example for him. And I wanted to do something to, um, to help myself move forward. With things. So I decided later that day, and I contacted David that maybe he could do with my help. And he said, sure, whatever capacity you want to be in. So I started volunteering and kind of helping out. So fast forward to 2018. In 2018, I decided that I would host an annual Run for Sharks and Ocean Protection. And it's now called the Run for Sharks and Ocean Health Fair. So this is a 5K one mile fun run. And basically our aim is to share our knowledge about sharks and how important they are to the ecosystem and all our lobby efforts and all our programs that we do. So this is a picture of our first event in 2018. And we had a pretty good turnout. We had over 50 people turn out. In the far top corner, you see a, a table with a bunch of jaws on it. Those are our good friends, Jim Sherpa and his, his uh, crony, and they're ex-forestry rangers, and they come with their table of shark paraphernalia, and they show the kids all these cool artifacts about sharks, and the kids are just so enthralled and so excited to learn and to, to see all these, these jaws and, and, and little posters and things that they have. And of course, David is always there with his table to tell them about what Shark Stewards does and all the programs that we have running. So that's a picture of David and I, and I'm dressed up as a shark with a shark head. And we're just making a few announcements there. So fast forward to last year, and this is our race from last year. So we've done this race now four years in a row. This is one of our participants in a hammerhead suit. We've got some great families that, that come out uh, we've got the gentleman in the front there is from Long Beach area. He does beach cleanups with Newport Surfrider. Uh, the, the little kids on the corner there, 
That's Tommy Sicone with his good friend Giovanni that he brought this year on his fourth year in a row. And they had such an awesome time. You can see the smiles on their faces. And it's just a wonderful event that we can just share our passion for the ocean and get some fitness and fun along the way. So Hillary, I'm just gonna let you take over a little bit and mute myself. Great, well, thank you so much, Maria, for sharing your story. It's um, so inspiring to, to hear just how you recovered from that incident. Uh, I, I just can't imagine. Um, at this point, we'd like to open it up for questions. If anybody has questions for Maria about her incident or about her Run for Sharks um, event, I did just allow you to unmute yourself. So anyone can unmute yourself if you would like to ask a question or you may also type your question into the chat and we'll just um, give a few minutes for questions. I did notice uh, Linda up there in the corner. I think I met Linda at one of the beach cleanups in Newport. Yeah, I oh. see that Linda has unmuted herself. Linda, did you have a question? No, I was just, I'm, I'm just in awe that, that, uh, she, that Maria survived that, those hellacious. Uh, yes. Yeah, um, I mean, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't even know what to say. <laughs> well, it is it is rather flabbergasting, and and um, I didn't kind of list my injuries, but my injuries were um, it cracked, it broke three ribs, it fractured my pelvis, it bit through my liver, and part okay. of my liver was actually missing. But the doctors told me that would regenerate. Um, and then with my arm, because it detached my tricep, I had to keep my arm straight and in a brace for a month while it reattached and while it healed before I could start any physical therapy on it. And so, then, but you're, no, go so ahead. You're, I was just gonna say, so you're, you're back to 100%? So yeah, I'm, I'm pretty much back to 100%. I can do everything I want to do. Uh, because it, set, it fractured my pelvis, it actually bit through my lateral femoral nerve. So the only long-term damage is I have a numb uh, thigh in the front area. It's kind of like dead for the first like two inches. So it feels a little bit funny when you touch it. And it, like if I drop a piece of hot food on it, I can't really feel it. And then I have some numb areas like in my back and my arm and I have muscle missing in my arm and I have a muscle, some muscle missing in my back because a shark has really sharp teeth. And when it draws away, it will take chunks of muscle with it. Mm. And, and so that's why I'm kind of missing some muscle, but I'm totally functional. I do have a, a bit of a rib issue in the front more than the back. And it's probably because when you break your ribs, it collapses your lung. So my right diaphragm has a lot of scar tissue around it. So it doesn't descend the whole way. So taking a sharp breath or a, like heavy cardio can be very annoying to the ribs. And I just wow. have like a little kind of like, just like a, a thud, like a dull pain there during the day. And if I do a lot of activity, it gets a little bit worse at night. So it's usually at night versus during the day. Cause the, during the day is kind of like when you get injured, during the day, you're more comfortable because you're moving around and you're warmed up. But yeah. at night when you're tired and you're cooling down, everything restricts and everything gets tighter. Yeah. So. Well, well, I admire you very much for toughing it out and, and becoming an advocate. That's awesome. Well, that's thank you very much, Linda. So I really appreciate that. I did want to uh, go forward one screen because I did want to tell you a little bit about um, the next screen. Let me see if I can advance it. I think I'm frozen. Let me see. There it is. So um, the last screen I had, these are the shark attack survivors 
um, that I met after my incident. And I actually got back in the water at Corona Del Mar three years later in 2019. So that was my first official swim back. And if you see on the top corner, Stephen Robles is a gentleman in the shorts. He got bitten in Manhattan Beach on July 7th in 2014. The young man with the uh, snorkel, he is a, um, he was 14 at the time of his incident. He also got bit by a great white. So we all got bit by great white sharks. Um, Keen Weber Hayes got bit and he was um, spearfishing and the shark was actually beside him and vied for the same fish that he had. And then Leanne Erickson was body surfing and there was actually a seal that crossed in front of her. So they think the shark was chasing the seal and it hit her fin. And because her fin from uh, body surfing kind of feels like a seal tail, it let go and then it grabbed the back of her leg and ripped the back of her leg right off. Um, but we all were extremely fortunate that first aid was close by. And so all of us got first aid almost within a couple minutes of our incident and got uh, ourselves out of the water. And we were able to survive just because of the first aid was close by and there was someone there to help. Um, yeah, that's remarkable that the, that the lifeguard boat was there because you said it you, you generally isn't. Exactly. And, and the thing about that is um, because it was Memorial Day weekend, there's a lot of people jumping off the cliffs and doing crazy things. And this woman had actually jumped off the cliff in Little Corona and um, cut her leg. So they were there doing some first aid. Oh. And then they decided to come into the bay and do some training. And Andy was about to jump in the water in his wetsuit and do some scuba diving when um, I called for help. So they were called off, you know, off of their training and they, um, and actually the lifeguards, the main lifeguard had saw a fin and a splash, but they thought it was a whale. So when the boat came over to check on me, they basically were told, you know, stay on the beach, don't worry about it. We got the girl. And then when my husband kind of came to the lifeguards, he's like, where's my wife? Because they clear the beach, they bring a helicopter out and they clear the beach to look for the shark. So they didn't find the shark because it dove back underwater. And, you know, my husband's like looking for me and he's like, where's my wife? And they're like, oh, the boat will bring her to shore. Don't worry about it. And then when my son came running in and he said, you know, I tried looking for mom and a seagull flew away and I can't find mom. Where's my mom? Um, the lifeguard approached him and told him to come to the office. And that's when he was told to meet me at the hospital. Oh, wow. Yeah. And how so, old was your son at the time? He was 16. He was 16. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a pretty shocking thing to hear. Like, okay, you're going to have to meet your wife at the hospital. Something happened. And Amazing. they didn't tell him. Yeah. They didn't tell him right away what had happened. Um, but my son. Yeah. It was pretty scary. My son overheard that someone said I got bit by a seal. And he basically yelled to his girlfriend. I hope that wasn't my mom because I don't think my mom would get bit by a seal. But yeah, it was kind of scary for sure. Maria? Yes. Have you changed wearing a black wetsuit? Um, no, I haven't, Carol. Um, and really the reason for that is um, I really, this is like, a. I tell people I won the lottery in a bad way and then I won it in a good way because I survived. Um, because really this incident is like, even though we hear about these things and there were like Keen, Leanne was after me about a year later. Keen Weber Hayes was in 2018. Um, I think a, a lot of times when we have a shark attack or a shark victim or, or any kind of horrific accident like this, it's in the news very quickly and very often. But in, in essence, these things don't happen. No, they don't. A lot. You know, it, it's a very rare instance. And so I really haven't changed any of my swimming habits. You know, well, not what I wear. Now, it's, you're less likely to get bit by something or be mistaken for a seal if you're in just a bathing suit. Because obviously a bathing suit with your white skin, being a human, 
you know, they're not going to look up and it's the picture that they're going to see is going to be different because a shark has all the senses we have. Yeah. And so they use vision, they use smell, they use um, a special uh, uh, electromagnetic thing on their snout called an ambuli Lorenzini, which I'll talk about it in a little bit. So the only thing I've changed is I don't swim alone anymore. Because I think when you're alone, you're more at risk if something happens. And then to get help, you're less chance of getting help, right? Mm -hmm. And I think there's safety in groups. So I swim with my group every Sunday there when triathlon season is back in. And um, it did take quite a while for our triathlon groups to get back into that area because of my incident. So a lot of people stayed away from the water in that area for about a year or so. And then we kind of gradually started getting back in and, and meeting there and training. So, um, you know, and, and it's kind of like falling off a bike or falling off a horse, right? You got to get back on the barrel. And, you know, even my lifeguard, he was told, Andy was told soon after my incident, he said, listen, you got to go and you got to go for a swim. You got to go and get back in at Newport. You got to go and get back in at Corona del Mar because that's your job, right? So even the lifeguards were told, listen, we got to go back in. We got to, we got to do our job. And now just because of my incident, they do do training with the, the lifeguards in Newport and all the lifeguards in Orange County about shark attacks and how to attend to a victim, how do you, you know, making sure that the tourniquets are in their packets and things like that. So um, it's been a huge learning experience for me. Maria, we do have a couple of questions from the chat. Um, they're, they're actually okay. adding up here. Um, but Joe Carroll had asked, um, she said, nine days in the hospital, so glad you recovered well. And I would reiterate that. Um, how close was that shark to doing more, much more major damage? Um, Good question. So, yeah, I found out later and, you know, I did start actually volunteering at the hospital where they treated me, Orange County Global Medical. That is the uh, trauma center in Santa Ana for the, for that for Newport and for the general area there, they do a lot of um, accidents like traffic accidents and drug overdoses and stabbing victims. But um, yeah, so I learned about a year later, almost a year and a half later, that if my arm wasn't in front, it would have hit my heart. It missed my heart by centimeters. Wow. Because there is a bite mark right in between my chest um, that a tooth like actually pierced my skin. And, uh, and that's where, you know, the ribs were affected there. And then in the pelvic region, you know, if it was any higher up, it would have hit all my major organs. And so that would have been pretty devastating because then, you know, my liver was bit through, but your liver regenerates. There's a lot of other organs like your stomach or, you know, other things. That, I mean, if it, if it had come any closer to any organs, it would have been so much more severe and the bleed out like the bleed out from the arm alone was two blood transfusions. So I was pretty much um, going, not really out, going into shock, I guess. And like they had to stabilize me in the ambulance because when the EMS arrived at Balboa Pier at the Coast Guard there, they were going to do first aid on me in the boat. And Mike or the driver, he basically said, you got to take her now because you got to stabilize her in the ambulance because she's crashing because of my blood loss. And then I also did find out that the tricep, the way the tricep was, was ripped off, it missed the nerve that's attached to my arm by centimeters as well. So when my oh. surgeon, yeah, because when my surgeon came up to check my arm, he took it off the first like three days in when I was finally cleared from ICU, I went upstairs um, and he came and checked on me and he took my brace off and checked my wound and everything. And he said, can you wiggle your fingers? And so I wiggled my finger and he said, that's kind of cool. I said, what's so cool about it? He said, well, it missed your nerve that's attached to your hand by centimeters, literally centimeters. So obviously it wow. could have been so much worse, so much worse. Yeah, mm. that's incredible. Yeah, yeah. Um, we have a question from Crystal 
She said, thank you so much for sharing your story, Maria. You have such a positive outlook and used your incident as motivation to be a role model for your son. Just two questions. What was it like for you mentally dealing with the aftermath? Also, what is it like telling your story over and over again? So um, I'll answer the second question first. So I don't really mind telling my story over and over again, because for me, it makes it um, it's part of my therapy. <laughs> I find it part of my therapy. Um, it just kind of, because in truth, sometimes I think to myself, I was, was I bit by a shark? Yeah, I was really bit by a shark because I see the scars and I, and I see, and I see things on me and, you know, you know, it's not that people ask me about my scars. It's just like, sometimes I, I think to myself, I was so lucky because I'm fully functional. You know, I, I can do everything I want to do and I don't have a lot of pain. Whereas Keen Weber Hayes and Leanne Erickson, you know, Leanne's had multiple surgeries to reconstruct her whole leg. And Keen Weber Hayes has had multiple surgeries also. He's actually missing a bone in his back because it got him on the shoulder. And he's done extensive therapy just to get back to where he is. But, you know, the amazing thing is when you talk about talk to other shark attack survivors like Stephen Robles. He was bit way back in 2014. We all got back in the water. We all got back to the sport that we love. Well, Leanne hasn't got back in because her incident was very, very traumatic for her. She got pulled underwater. She almost drowned. Um, so, her, and she actually saw the shark and had to punch it in the eye. Um, for me, it's, it's therapy for me. And then um, the first question about the mental state Every time I go back in the water and swim with my group, it is a little bit of a mental hiccup for me to just say, you know what, you're with your group. Everything's going to be okay. This is a very rare thing. It's not going to happen again. You'll be fine. Um, and so I did do some therapy with a woman after my incident just to get me back to the race I wanted to do because it was in San Diego. It was in Mission Bay. It was in open water. Um, and just to get back in the water myself to do some training, I went to Pirate's Cove, which is on the other side of the main beach. And each time I got in there, I realized I needed some help because I was so nervous in the water. I was looking up like every five strokes and every five strokes I'd look out to. And I was in the, you know, the channel there and I'd look out to the channel and I'd be like, OK, is there a shark coming? Is there a fin there? And so it, it's a very, um, and I think, and every time I go in the water, I like, I kind of look for sharks and I say to myself, what would you do if you saw a shark? And so that's also one of the reasons why I connected with David is because, you know, he's a surfer, he's a marine biologist, he's a scuba diver, he's a swimmer, and he swims in San Francisco. He swims from Alcatraz to the San Francisco shore, you know, and so he knows the risk and he's told me the risk often and it's minimal. And so I just have to kind of go through that thought process. And so the therapist basically said for me, when I got back in the water for my first race, she said, okay, how are you going to treat this? I said, well, I said, it's an enclosed bay. There's one entrance and one exit. I said, the chances of a big shark getting there are pretty small. So I think I feel a little bit safer. And she's like, okay, great. She goes, what else? I said, well, I said, I'm going to put myself in the survivor wave. And the survivor wave in that race, it's more uh, cancer survivors. But they're just like, you're a survivor of another kind. You can go in our wave. And I'm like, gee, thank you so much. Because I did ask permission. I didn't want to just assume. And there's over 200 people in that race. So I said, listen, there's going to be 200 people in the water. And she's OK, do you feel safe? And I said, yes, I do. So she goes, OK, go have fun. And then she goes, what else? I said, well, there's going to be boats out there. There's going to be sea dudes. There's going to be people on surfboards. I said, they're there to watch us to make sure that we don't drown and then we don't get hit in the head and things like that. And she goes, okay, great. What else? I said, well, my son said he'd be my buddy swimmer. And another gentleman I met at another race said he'd be my buddy swimmer. And I'll have two people swimming with me on either side of me. And, and she goes, so how do you feel? I said, I feel great. Let's go race. And so that's how I got in the first time at a race. Um, but like I said, you know, it is um, a mental hiccup. 
I think. And once I get in and I start swimming, it all fades away and I start enjoying the ocean and why I'm there and, and do my training. And, um, and I have a wonderful time and I enjoy myself immensely. And that's why I actually got scuba certified in 2019 because my son said to me, mom, you're part of the environment. If you're underwater, if you're on the surface, you're prey. <laughs> and I'm like, thanks, honey. <laughs> yeah, it's not something I really wanted to hear, but <laughs> you know, snorkeling has been so much fun snorkeling on Catalina. I just thought, you know what, if I could get down closer to the, the, um, the fish and the starfish and the, the crabs and all those things underwater, I'm going to go get my scuba license. So um, I got that in 2019 and I'm about to do my advanced cert and we're going to be diving with seven gill sharks in San Diego in about a month. So that's going to be a pretty uh, hairy thing for me, but I think I got it and um, I'm kind of looking forward to it. That's wow. amazing. <laughs> so we have one more question in the chat um, from Diana. She says, I admire your response to your incident. It takes a lot to focus on the big picture when something happens to you, regardless of the overall odds of that event occurring. What would have happened if they found a shark or a shark shortly after your incident? Um, so I'm not too sure about that. Given that it's, um, it's Southern California and that Chris Lowe has a shark study and that he tags sharks. I think the first thing that would have happened is if they did find a shark, they would try and catch it obviously and see if it was a tagged shark. If it was a tagged shark, then they could go to Chris Lowe and say, listen, we, we've got the shark. We believe it bit somebody. This is a tag number. And then, so what Chris Lowe does is he tags the juveniles and he just, he watches their travel patterns and where they swim and where they go. So in 2016 into 2017, when Keen got bit, um, they did notice there was a lot of juveniles in the area and close to shore. So he was out quite often that year and into the following years, just tagging sharks. Um, and because great whites are protected, I don't think they would be able to kill it um, but you know, the general public might want that. Um, but I would definitely say don't, um, but the problem with catch and release and the problem with, um, you know, unless you're, you're a professional, you know how to do it. Like fishermen fish off piers, they catch a great white. They take a selfie with it. It's out of the water for an hour or a half an hour and they get compromised. They throw them back in and they could be injured or whatever. Sometimes they die. Um, so it's kind of hard to say because really, I mean, Bethany Hamilton, they say they caught the shark that bit Bethany Hamilton, but you don't really know, you know, which shark it is or, or, or if it's the right shark, because it's not like you're going to find DNA in its mouth to match up to me or to match up to Bethany, you know, unless you killed the shark and then looked in his stomach and said, oh, I found a piece, I found Bethany's arm, you know, it's kind of gory to say that, but it's a very slim possibility that if they did catch a shark, that it would be the right one. So would they be able to, would they be able to potentially match the shark? Um, because I know you said that marine biologists had taken, had found some of the shark's DNA on your wetsuit. So if they had found that, would they be able to potentially match it if they found the shark? Well, the, I guess they can only match it if it's tagged and it has the number because when they tag a shark, they do DNA them and they sex them. So they do take DNA when they tag and they do check to see if it's a male or female and things like that. So they do take certain stats on a tag shark. So that would be a possibility, but if it's not tagged then you're pretty much out of luck. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Don't, don't step on the computer. Yeah. yeah. So would, everybody, would anybody like to know more about sharks and shark stewards? Absolutely. Yeah. Why don't you go ahead and, and tell us about that, Maria? It looks okay, like we've sure. got everyone's questions. All right, cool. And then if you guys have any questions towards the end, Hillary and I were talking and David had 
had sent us an email. But if you have any detailed questions about Shark Stewards, how you can volunteer, you can go to sharkstewards.org and um, send an, uh, an information or, or an email out to David with any questions or any volunteer opportunities. You can also email me at runforsharks.org. And our fifth annual Run for Sharks is going to be on October 22nd this year in Newport Dunes Waterfront Resort. So our Run for Sharks page will send out an email um, and we'll be posting it on Facebook when it gets closer to the event. So just to kind of throw that out there for you. Um, so I'm gonna jump forward and we're gonna talk a little bit about shark stewards and what we do and why we save sharks. So this is a picture of some cool hammerhead sharks on um, our Cal, Cal Academy of Sciences. So we do various programs with very institutions that sometimes sponsor us or sometimes they just give us like undergrads to go into some studies. So Cal Academy of Science is one of the organizations we work with. National Geographic is also a, um, an organization we work with. David actually writes um, some articles for them. He does an eco blitz with them, with his kids um, up in Northern California. They have a beach project there and they do an eco blitz in one of their beach cleanups and they, they just register all that with National Geographic. So they're a pretty cool organization. They've given him a couple like GoPros and rovers and things so that when he does his trips, if you ever wanna meet David and do a trip to the Fairlawn Islands, he does trips to the Fairlawn Islands over um, shark season and whale season. And you can go out to the Fairlawn Islands and hopefully see a shark or see a whale and he uh, will tell you all about the biology and the Fairline Islands and why they're important to the ecosystem and all the studies that they do there because they have birds on there, the nesting and all kinds of other things. Um, and then of course we do expeditions overseas. So we do expeditions to Indonesia, Malaysia, um, Hawaii, and uh, we have a, a bunch of partners out there um, that we do like coral restoration on reefs. We do shark relocation in Indonesia. So David has a bunch of different projects he works on. He's actually working closely with Sylvia Earle right now. Sylvia Earle is a scuba diver. They call her Miss Deepness because she's been a scuba diver for a really, really long time. She's like 84 years old and she's still going strong. But David and her are trying to establish a hope spot on Timor-Leste which is an island in the South Pacific. I'm not too sure where, David could tell you. Uh, but David was down there doing a study with Sylvia Earle. It's a beautiful, beautiful reef. They have as much biodiversity as the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, but there's no bleaching of coral there or anything like that. So it's been pristine location and it is a blue whale migration spot. So they're trying to make it a blue hope spot. So. Dave has actually met Sylvia Earle and, and they're working closely to kind of protect that area. So we also protect MPAs. So California is full of a ton of cool sharks. So not only the great white shark lives in California, but we have a lot of sharks from every level of the ocean. So from the sand to the middle of the ocean to the you know, the blueness you see here of this great white. So I'm gonna go through just a couple of the cool sharks that we have. We have like over 200 sharks in Southern California. So we have the salmon shark. And if you see the salmon shark, this is a picture by Brooke Olson, looks a lot like a great white on its belly, but the shape of it is totally different. Um, we have a basking shark, which is one of the biggest sharks. Um, and these are all the scientific names, which I'm not even gonna try and pronounce, but David can do it in an in instant. Um, and you can see his mouth is wide open, but he's not gonna eat that scuba diver because all the basking shark eats is shrimp or basically just microscopic organisms, much like a whale shark. And then we have the thresher shark. You can see that telltale, the tail is just so long and huge. What it does is it slaps the water and it will stun the fish. So you can see those fish kind of floating in the background. So it hits the water with its fin, the back fin there, and it, it creates a vibration that stuns the fish. And then it just goes around and just eats all the fish. They can't even swim because they're just stunned. The, 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 the pressure of the water just stunned them so much that they can't even swim. So that's a pretty cool adaptation for them. 
Um, we have the seven gill sharks. So these are the sharks that I'm gonna go dive with in April in uh, San Diego area. The seven gill shark is a pretty calm shark. It's very uh, shy and it's got spots on it and stuff. So we're trying, we have a study right now to identify seven gill sharks. And we're trying to um, include scuba divers in this study, anybody that goes in the ocean. And it's a, a metrics that we've uh, used with tiger sharks in Hawaii with a study down there to identify the shark just by their pattern of, of, of spots on them. So you can take a picture of this shark, you can upload it to our QR code, and then we make a, a nice little, you know, graph of all these sharks. And we're trying to identify this, you know, how many individuals there are in La Jolla area and San Diego area. That's where they usually populate, um, but they are throughout California. And then we have the Mako shark. So the Mako shark, this is a pretty fast moving shark. As you can see, it's got a short body. It doesn't grow very big. The top end is probably six to eight feet, maybe less than that, but it's really, really fast. So these guys catch actually salmon and um, bluefin tuna and things like that. So they're really fast. They can go and just, you can see his teeth are pretty sharp and it will um, just go really quick with that tail and it'll It'll be at his prey in no time. But these guys are actually on the threatened species list. So we're trying to get them protected on the CITES. And that's one of the projects we're actually working on with uh, lobby efforts to protect the mako shark because they are very, um, you don't see a lot of them and they are on the threatened list. As well as the blue shark. So the blue shark is another beautiful shark. It's a smaller shark also. And back in the day when David was, first certified to go scuba diving, he would go to Catalina diving and he would see over 200 sharks of blue sharks sunning themselves on the surface of the ocean, much like you see the dolphins when you go to Catalina. And you don't see that anymore. It's, they're very uh, hard to find. David goes diving to kind of find them in certain areas and he could dive for two days straight and not even see a blue shark. So, and that's pretty sad when you think about 20 years ago, there was over a hundred just sunning themselves on the surface of the ocean. Um, and then we have the leopard shark. So these leopard sharks, the sweet fin shark, they're more like in the middle of the ocean. They like to go around the kelp and that's where they have their babies. And they're pretty cool sharks. They, they're very, you can see their mouths around the bottom. So they are very non-threatening. They're very calm. And I would swim with these guys in an instant because I know I'm not going to be harmed at all. And I've actually seen leopard sharks on some of the dives I've done. Just little small guys. They're only like three footers, but they're really cute sharks. And then we have this guy here. This is a spiny dogfish. He's a really small shark and he's a bottom feeder. And then we have, if you didn't know, a guitar fish is a shark. So they don't look like a shark, but they are a shark and they just live on the bottom of the ocean and they just suck up stuff out of the sand. And then we have even stingrays. Stingrays are a kind of shark. So here we have stingrays in the water and at Corona del Mar, there's actually stingrays right there and bat rays. So we shuffle when we go in the water there. So if you ever go in the ocean, guys, shuffle your feet. That will send vibrations through the sand and it will scare any stingrays away so that you don't get stung. Um, because a stingray sting is pretty severe. You have to put your foot in a really hot tank of water and it, it could swell up and it could be hurting you for days, depending on your reaction, because it is like a venom that goes into your skin. Um, and then this is a bat ray. You've probably seen these at the aquariums, at the Aquarium of the Pacifica. They will have bat rays, they'll have the um, guitar fish, and they'll have stingrays and you can actually do the touch tank and touch them with your fingers. And they feel really leathery and smooth. It's, they're really quite cool. And they have funny little faces on them. And then a skate, a skate is also a kind of shark. So these like just look like a triangle and they're pretty cool looking. And those little um, dots on there, that's kind of like a mechanism for predators to stay away from them because they look like big eyes. And then they're like, oh, this is a really big eyed animal. I don't want to eat that. It's going to like, it kind of scares me away, right? So pretty cool how nature 
puts all these cool little mechanisms into, into our creatures to help them survive. So what exactly is a shark? As you can see, that little tiny dot there is a shark. It's called a lantern shark. And it's no bigger than the page that this is actually on, okay? And then we have the great white shark in the top end there and the whale shark is that blue one. So he's the biggest one. And the whale sharks are really, really calm, just like the basking shark. But basically sharks are a cartilaginous fish, meaning that their skeleton is more like your nose or your ear, okay? So, and because their skeleton is more cartilage, um, you, it can move quickly and it can bend. So it can swim fast, it can bend, it can turn quickly. And that's an advantage when you're hunting for prey and when you're looking for food, right? So it makes them a good hunter because they can swim fast, they can turn and they can chase a seal and they can hopefully get their food and, um, and move on. And, and, you know, sharks are pretty cool because they've been around and on the earth for over a thousand years. So by keeping sharks in the ecosystem, they're actually very um, important to the ecosystem because as a top predator, they get rid of the dead, the, the dying and the decay. And they also eat other things that are out there that other animals aren't gonna eat because they're not very discriminatory in what they eat. Um, so a shark can be less than three feet long and it can be as big as a whale shark, which is like a school bus size. So, and like 60 feet long. So it's pretty cool when you think that the top sharks that we actually know anything about, the great white, the bull shark and the tiger shark, which are all the sharks that basically bite people, we know more about them than a lantern shark or a cookie cutter shark or a whale shark. You know, we know about whale sharks just because they're a big shark, but we don't, there's over, I don't know, 500 species of sharks. And that's not even including the stingrays and all the other ones. So it's, it's a pretty interesting um, area to dive into. And I've just brushed the surface in my knowledge of sharks. So um, David does talks all over. He does some at Ocean Institutes and things like that. So you should really get him back, Hillary, when he has a little bit more time and he can get a little bit more in depth on these things, on these beautiful creatures. So here's a little bit about shark anatomy. So basically in this picture, I mean, shark has every sense that a human has. It has a liver, it has a stomach. It has all these cool, organs and stuff that we have. And it, it basically what's special about a shark though, is it has to move all the time. If a shark isn't moving, it basically dies because all these organs need oxygen. They need um, to be sustained. So a shark has to move because all that oxygen goes across its gills and through its system to make sure all these important organisms are working. So even looking at the skeleton in this picture, it looks like bone, but we know it's cartilage because it can move so quickly and they've done studies obviously. And if you look at the dorsal fin, the dorsal fin helps to keep a shark upright. It keeps it steady in the water. So that's very important to its overall survival. And if you uh, look at its snout, around the nostril area there, and it's kind of hard in this picture, but you might be able to like click on it and zoom in, but these little dots on its snout are called the ambuli of Lorenzini. And I kind of talked a little bit about them at the beginning. So the ambuli of Lorenzini are a really special organ that only a shark has. And it's small pores on their snout that can detect electrical currents in the water. So basically anything gives off an electrical current. So when you're swimming, when you're splashing, all those noises take an electrical current through the water and a shark can pick those up over a mile away and a distressed fish and it can sense those things and it can pick it up just from the electrical inputs moving through the water. So it can notice a, an engine of a boat. It can notice the heartbeat of a human. It can, it, can see, it can see with its eyes, it can smell with its, its nose, 
and it can, you know, it has all the senses of a human as well as this special organ. So when you think about it, a shark is pretty damn well made, right? And so adept to hunting and, and being a predator. And it's got this muscle mass on it that makes it so strong. And it's actually got two types of muscle, red muscle and white muscle, which humans have as well. Okay, so red muscle in humans is, is more built for like strength and white muscle kinds of gives us endurance and things like that. So it's kind of red muscle in sharks breaks down the fat into energy and it enables them to swim longer distances. Whereas the white muscle breaks down the sugars, which enables it to sprint and to go out and catch prey, right? And escape other predators if, because sharks eat other sharks. Basically, if you're the biggest guy in the ocean, you're gonna eat something small. So if this small shark swims by and he's close to you and you're hungry, you might wanna eat that instead of the fish that goes by because the fish might be able to swim a little faster. But who knows, right? It's all um, kind of like a work in progress. <laughs> but anyway, I find sharks really fascinating just because of all these different things that they are made up of. And they've been around for thousands of years. And you don't stay on this earth for thousands of years unless you have a great immune system and you're a pretty good at surviving. So, um, and they can swim 5,000 miles just to find food and just to find a mate. So uh, could you imagine going 5,000 miles for a burger? There's no way that's gonna happen in hell. Um, so let's just bump on forward and talk about baby sharks because baby sharks are even cooler um, because sharks can give birth three different ways. Now, like, I, so they can give birth like a human. So they keep the baby inside them. It's an embryo. They feed their embryo inside and then they birth it just like a baby, okay? The other way is this shark egg case, which is up here in this corner. And is, this is called a mermaid's purse, kind of looks like a little purse. And what they do is, is they, they have this egg, they lay the egg, and then this mermaid purse is formed around the egg and the embryo develops inside the egg or the, the egg, the embryo develops inside this mermaid's purse. It's attached to a piece of kelp with all these little squiggly things and is protected in a kelp bed. And then as the shark gets bigger, it chews through the case and escapes. And then it just goes along its merry way, which I, I think is pretty cool. And so there's a, actually a yolk inside there and it kind of like eats on that and it, it grows and, and um, this is an excerpt from David's book that he just um, has out. And it'll tell you all about sharks and a bunch of cool facts. And this shark bite down the corner gives you some, like, some kind of like little cool facts about sharks along the way. And sometimes a project to do with your kids at home. So um, some sharks are gestation is like up to nine months or a year. And then other sharks, like the dogfish, takes three years to have a baby and to actually birth a, a second, another shark. So protecting sharks is really important because, I mean, if you think it takes three years to have a kid um, and you're just swimming around the ocean, for you to get that far and to be healthy and strong to have a, a an offspring you're going to have to you know stay away from humans number one and um be pretty good at what you do and and surviving so that's pretty cool i think and so i in the reproductive strategy this picture will kind of tell you the scientific way um that a shark gives birth so the viviparous and I may have said that wrong, is where it's kind of like a baby develop, develops inside the mother. And then, but this is with or without a placenta. So it can go either way. And then they're born alive, fully developed. Alviparius is the second one. This is where the eggs are laid externally. And that's where the mermaid's purse comes into hand and it's attached to a kelp bed. And the ovoviviparius is kind of a combination of the first two. So it's an egg that develops inside the shark mama, it's hatched internally, 
and then they birth the pup alive. So if we were human, we'd be able to like have three different ways of giving birth, but we're not um, as good as a shark. So I think that's pretty cool too. Um, and there's a couple of sharks there um, and they have, you know, coupling and everything like that. It's kind of like a little bit too much information, but hey, um, it's pretty cool though. All right, this uh, is an, kind of a, a little diagram of all the different senses and how they work. So your electrical sensors with the Ambuli Lorenzini are about three feet. So they go about three feet in the shark's kind of um, radius. So I was wrong, they're not gonna detect you a mile away, but they can hear a mile away. They can smell a quarter mile away and they can see up to 15 feet if the water is clear and um, not murky. My day, the, the water was murky. So it could kind of see a shape, but it couldn't make out what that shape was. So they figured that's one of the reasons why it came at me because it saw the shape and in a black wetsuit, I have the shape of a seal and much like a surfboard and really for surface, it's a shoreboard versus a longboard because a shoreboard looks more like a seal because it's more the size of a seal than a longboard. A longboard is much bigger. So um, I think it's, I mean, for humans, we couldn't hear something a mile away unless it's a really huge bang or something that's like pretty distinct, right? And smelling a quarter mile away is never gonna happen. 50 feet, we could probably see something, but depending on the day, if it's uh, a cloudy, you know, if it's a lot of pollution in LA, 15 feet might not be doable. Um, but I think a lot of you would agree that a, a shark has a pretty amazing set of um, senses. And this is a really good picture of the ambuli of Lorenzini. So you can see all those little electrical holes and all those little holes and that are around the whole nose and even down along the jaw and the mouth and all around his eye. And then here's a really detailed picture of the snout of a shark. And you can just see, it's like freckles. It's almost like freckles on your skin where they're actually little tiny holes, like he's been poked by a pen or something. And um, that's pretty, pretty specialized, right? And that's why I think, like I tell people, I've turned my fear into fascination because I really am fascinated with these creatures. They're just so amazing. And just marine life in general. I just think it's so cool. All right, so here's the teeth, okay? So, and I didn't know this until I actually saw David's presentation at the Ocean Institute in Dana Point about three months ago, and he had this slide. So a bat ray has more like this um, small picture here that's kind of, like a, a, a conveyor belt and those are teeth. So those teeth, and actually I was at the Ocean Institute for the whale festival. We got a chance to, to go in the parade and I was talking to a young gentleman there and he told me they just have a shark exhibit that they just got there. So if you wanna go touch some bat rays and some stingrays and, and a uh, guitar fish, they have a touch tank there. But he told me about the teeth. So a body feeder actually has this conveyor belt kind of teeth system. And what they do is they just, they don't really bite into things. They don't rip it apart. They just gum it to death. It's kind of like having gums and so not really sharp teeth. So they just kind of munch on shrimp and stuff and they gum it up and they might just suck it into their mouths. Versus the middle one, you can see all those pointed teeth. So that's what a great white shark has. That's what a, um, a blue shark and a mako shark has. And, it, and it's just not one row of teeth. It's, it's like three or four rows of teeth because when they lose a teeth, a tooth, they wanna be able to grow one right away. And, and so you've got a second row ready to go. And it's, it's not like humans, right? So they're out there to eat, they're out there to survive. So this, having three rows of teeth is really gonna be an advantage. So even if 
they get injured, even if they lose a tooth, there's, there's another one there to grow back in. And the cool thing about, you know, the bigger sharks is they can detach their jaw from their mouth and shoot it out and open it wider because they can unhinge their jaw both ways. And that way they can fit more food in and they get a bigger meal, which is <laughs> like, there's no way a human's gonna do that, right? And then on the far side, you have another kind of mouth there and it's kind of like, it looks like a cross between the gummy guy and the tooth guy, but the teeth look really, really small. And that's what's gonna be on like a horn shark or maybe a leopard shark. And um, I think that that looks like a horn shark head. And, and I got a chance to, after my incident, I got an invite to the Aquarium of the Pacifica and I did a little um, documentary and I got to feed the leopard sharks there at their touch tank. And they just eat shrimp and they just hold them out on your hand and they suck them in. Um, and it's really cool. It's just like this, it's like a vacuum cleaner. They just suck them in. And so it was really neat to be able to do that. So here's some of the jaws and you can see a little bit closer how the teeth are, are kind of laid out. And um, if you've ever been to any of the bigger aquariums like Toronto, I'm from Canada and Toronto has an aquarium where you can walk through the tunnel and there's a few bigger aquariums that you can go to. And you see, I think it's seven gill sharks and they have a really weird mouth because you can see all their teeth and they're really sharp and all craggy and all going in different directions. And they look really mean and, and gross, but it's just amazing when you look at them because you're just like, that looks really weird, but really cool at the same time. Um, but you know, if that was us, we'd probably have dental work and make it a little bit more inviting. Um, but yeah, here's here's a bunch of jaws, and this is actually a seven gill jar on the on the right here, where all the little teeth. You can see the top row and the bottom row. So the bottom row is a little slightly different than the top row. And you know the reason why the bigger sharks have the sharper teeth is because they rip their food and they just rip it off, and then they chomp it down and they swallow it. So you got to have sharp teeth to be able to do that to a whale because a whale's skin is pretty thick. And then uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of our programs that we're doing. So shark finning is one of the biggest programs that we're doing. We have a lobby effort right now in the House of Representatives. It's passed the first level of government. It's about, um, and we're hoping it will pass the second level of government and be in law. Uh, and this is the shark finning practice. So basically it's pretty severe. Uh, this is a hammerhead. And they caught the shark just for his fins. They cut all the fins off. They throw the carcass back in the ocean. It can't swim. So it basically suffocates and dies because it can't breathe, because it can't swim. And then this is a guitar fish on the other side. And this is one of those bottom feeders. They get pretty big. So they're cutting off its fins and it's basically a dead shark. And then they will either sell the meat, which isn't very good anyway. Um, it's probably full of mercury and things like that. And, uh, and they might sell it to like a, a non-discriminatory person who might mix it in with tuna or whatever. So you really don't know where the meat's going on top of it. But this is for a rich man's soup. And basically a shark fin soup is not very nutritious because it is only the shark fin, which is made of cartilage and skin. And um, it's used in high profile business meetings, in weddings, high profile weddings. And it's to us and to, I think the general public, it's a very cruel way to treat a shark. It, it's uh, for not a very nutritious soup. And it's a needless practice that we want to get rid of. So that's why we lobby against it. So, Basically, it also threatens the shark with extinction, various, um, because they target the big ones, okay? So they're not, they're targeting the great whites, they're targeting the hammerheads, they're targeting all the bigger sharks. And some of those bigger sharks, like I had suggested, three years to have a baby, okay? A seven gill shark, a seven gill shark has 80 babies inside it ready to give birth, 
Okay, so if a seven gill shark is caught by a fisherman and they decide to kill it for a trophy or they decide to cut off all its fins and throw it back in the ocean, you're not only killing one shark, you're killing over 80 sharks with that one shark because it is a pregnant female. And they know it's a pregnant female because it's heavy and because it's big. Um, but that's the trophy, right? That's the trophy. So 100 million sharks and rays are killed every year in this trade. And that's 71% of oceanic sharks and rays because it's all the bigger ones. And so because of this, sharks are so important to a reef system to keeping the prey pop, the, the, the fish in healthy and the seals healthy. It causes a loss of habitat as well. And then we're also threatening a species like the hammerhead, the great hammerhead shark is in the shark fin trade. And there's very few of them left. So now they're, they're protected as well as the great white. Because after, you know, back in the seventies, after jaws and everything, there was a killing spree on great white sharks. So we did have to go and protect them. They're rebounding back, but we really don't know how many there are. And then we also have long line fishing, drift net fishing. So they all, we still do this in North America. They, they still do it in Indonesia and China. Um, there's a lot of boats and they're not regulated um, because they're out in the open ocean. So basically with a, the bycatch is what happens. So this fishing system, they just drop a huge net in the ocean. It goes to the ocean floor and they just take it up like a big purse. And everything from the ocean floor to the middle of the ocean to the top of the ocean is engulfed in this net and pulled ashore the boat. And then they just go through it and they um, either throw the shark carcasses back overboard or they fin them or the turtles. They're gonna catch turtles, they're gonna catch dolphins, they're gonna catch sharks, they're gonna catch small whales, um, all kinds of bycatch, which, you know, threaten species. And, um, and so we also have a lobby action against this that we're working closely with um, other departments in the government. And then, you know, sharks. So why do we save sharks? We save sharks because they are integral and critical for ocean health. And so if you look at this diagram here, you know, sharks regulate our prey populations like I just, um, you know, mentioned earlier, they get rid of the dead, the, the dying and the decayed. So if there's a fish that's been, you know, killed from another shark and it's just sitting around the ocean, they'll just go and eat it and, you know, it's all good. And they also maintain our oxygen supply because they're, they're moving through the ocean. They're, they're, you know, getting oxygen. They're, they're doing the exchange of oxygen and all those kinds of things. So they support oxygen production. They also fix the blue carbon. And so they are kind of helping with climate change because they'll go into a reef and, and they'll, um, they'll make sure that that reef is healthy. And, and um, because of this, like the, the, they eat various things, they keep the fish population strong so that the fish go along, they eat, um, eelgrass and other things so that the eelgrass is overpopulate a certain area and and various other things. David could tell you a lot more about this. this I'm just brushing the surface here. And, um, and there is a little bit more detail in the next slide. Um, so this is kind of the ecological role that a shark would play on a coral reef. So you see the top down arrows, you see the arrows coming up. So the shark at the top if you look on the conservation, it's a big circle. So he's gonna eat maybe a smaller shark and because he's gonna prey on the smaller shark and then that smaller shark is gonna decay and it's gonna go down into the reef system. And then the little fish might eat little bits of that shark. And then, you know, you have the coral there and then you have the bottom sharks on the bottom of the ocean, they eat various things and then the fish. So it's a big, huge cycle of nutrients is a big cycle of food and the whole reef benefits from that cycle. So if we take out, it's just like the Amazon forest. If you take out the top layer of the Amazon forest, the middle layer is affected, the bottom layer is affected. So we wanna keep that top down 
and that ecological circle going by keeping the shark in the reef and by keeping the shark in the ocean. And over 70% of our water we get from the ocean. So if the ocean is healthy, that means the human population is healthy. And we also get food from the ocean, right? We get our fish from the ocean. And um, so who, want, who would want more fish? We would because we eat fish. So I'd want a healthy reef because that means there's gonna be more fish. And then I'd be able to eat the fish that I like to eat. And um, you know, I don't know about you, but I eat fish probably once a week. The average Asian person eats a hundred pounds of fish a year. So, and then if you look at the piers along Southern California, we have a lot of Hispanic people. We have a lot of people that fish off the pier and sometimes that's their dinner for the night, right? So who, why not keep it, it healthy and strong? And that's my viewpoint on that. So, and here's kind of what I was talking about, the seagrass and the um, blue carbon. So this is a secret weapon about climate, of, against climate change. Protecting sharks supports the ocean biodiversity and the health and slow climate change just because of the way everything works and the top-down effect. So seagrass covers 0.1% of the ocean, but 70%, 17% of the global population's intake of animal protein comes from fish. So when we have seagrass metals, or meadows, right? So seagrass alone, if you think of green, right? Spinach, we eat spinach because there's a lot of iron in it and everything, right? So if you have a seagrass metal, it's got a thousand tons of carbon per hectare, which is more than if you look at on land, okay? A seagrass metal, uh, meadow, the size of a football field, it says vanishes every 30 minutes in the ocean, okay? And that's a lot of the reason for that is because of coral reefs and things. You have the whitening of the coral reef. So then other, species start dying. Um, it's also uh, in Florida, the, man the manatees, there's a high population of manatees in Florida, they eat seagrass. And so if you have a lot of manatees eating a lot of seagrass, the seagrass is gonna disappear. So a shark in that situation would come in, eat a couple manatees, keep the population in check, kind of like the wolves and the deer in the forest, right? If you don't have wolves in the forest, the deer don't stay um, kind of like at a sufficient level, the deer could actually take over and then they start grazing more and then that, that affects the whole ecological system of the forest, right? So it's kind of similar to the ocean. The shark is there to keep populations in check so that the seagrass can grow at a normal rate so that all those animals can benefit from the seagrass and then we benefit from that. So this is where the long line fishing comes into play because if you have this boat that's dropped a big net and it's engulfing not only the animals but it's also scraping the bottom of the ocean and pulling up the seagrass at the same time. So then we're left with an ocean bottom that's just basically sand um, which in my opinion is not a good thing and I'm sure a lot of you there would agree. So this is one of our students and we went to Canada and we uh, took the shark fin ban up to Canada in Vancouver and we made some posters and Canada passed it last year. Um, Trudeau, when Trudeau was a prime minister, I think a couple of years ago, they passed the shark fin elimination act in Vancouver and in Canada. So it's been passed up there. And like I said, it is in the uh, second level of government here. So we have a shark fin uh, ban a signature list on our website. So if you'd like to go there and sign our petition, you can do that. And you can also go to your local congressperson and tell them uh, of your concerns. So that's one of the lobby efforts we are doing. Um, another one, so here is a picture of some of the things that happen when you fish for sharks. So these on the right with the fishermen, those are seven gill sharks and those are pregnant females. So those are two pregnant females. They're about probably 800 pounds each. But as I mentioned before, they could have up to 80 to 100 babies inside. So these guys are just doing an Instagram post. They might eat them. They might not eat them. And they might just throw them back in the ocean. 
But right now they're basically suffocating on the deck because they can't breathe in the open air. And then this poor shark was caught probably by a fisherman. It damaged its gill. It looks like it damaged its fin and it's releasing it back into the ocean, but we don't know if it's gonna survive or not. So one of the other programs we have going right now is a shark watch. So shark watch is kind of, we've got people out there on the beaches of California, on the piers, and we're actually documenting people catching sharks off the beach or off of the pier and documenting all that data so we can get a better idea. We have a QR code that we've set up. So if you are a fisher man or, or woman, or you're on a pier and you see a shark being caught and you can identify it, you can QR our code, you can scan our code, you can enter it in. And um, if you wanna learn more about that, it is on our website or you can contact David about that if you're interested in participating or helping out. Um, the blue part there, that, those are leopard sharks. So mostly it's leopard sharks. Thresher sharks are the red part. And then the smaller ones there, the orange one and the yellow and that other teal color. The teal color are the great white sharks, that's 7%. The thresher sharks are about 21% that are caught. Leopard sharks are caught the most, 34%, almost 35% are leopard sharks. And then soup fin sharks are relatively small shark. They're about 8%. And seven gill sharks, which are the ones up in San Diego, they're about 7%. And then the next one, the purple one is the mako shark. And it kind of goes down from there. But, um, you know, these are just like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Those are 10 sharks that are caught often along California. So just a, a little snippet there of what we do. And then of course we do education. So we try and educate just fishermen in general and women and just the general public on how to avoid catching sharks or safe release practices. You know, you don't want to damage the shark. You want to make sure that if you do catch a shark and you, you don't want to eat it, that you take that hook out as quick as possible and let it back in the ocean as quick as possible. And then if you do see a shark that has a tag on it, you know, get that tag number and submit it to Chris Lowe or somebody so that we can, we can figure out what it is. So we're trying to get signage on the local piers. We're trying to um, kind of get a system and working with Fish and Wildlife to get that started and up and running. So that's also another project we're working on. And then the other one we have in, in the, by 2025, we're trying to um, do this 30% by 30 by 2030. So one of our goals to try and get this done by 2025, 2030 at the latest, but basically it's 30% of the ocean to be protected by the year of 2030. And really guys, we're in 2022. So that's only seven years, eight years, eight years we have. So what that's gonna be um, is to protect 30% of the ocean. So on land, we have, with, between our national parks and everything, only 18% of land is national parks. But in the ocean, it's only 7% right now, globally. 80% of the ocean is unexplored. 90% of the ocean, or no, 90% of land is habitable but you can also live, you know, obviously out in the ocean if you have the right boat. Um, but 70% of the ocean is the earth, okay? So earth is 70% ocean and only 30% land. So there's a lot more ocean out there than there is land. So I think it's very, very important for us to protect the oceans because we know less about the oceans than we knew about space. Um, we can send astronauts up to space. We're doing a lot of space studies, you know, but looking in the ocean and studying the ocean has been um, one of those other projects that is basically 80% is unexplored. So we got to get on that as soon as we can. So the more people that are on board, the better, right? Because we can make a difference because there's a lot of us on this earth. 
Um, one of the uh, marine sanctuaries were uh, part of the uh, lobby efforts to protect, and this is actually, they just sent out a survey on this last year, as the Chumash Heritage National Marine Sanctuary up um, further up north along California. So this is a um, area where there's a lot of species on land as well as in the ocean that's been a, um, an area that's been protected for a really long time. And when the Trump administration was in, they wanted to allow drilling in there or some kind of like environmental stuff going on. And the, you know, we came in there along with other groups that said, no, this isn't gonna happen because this is a heritage site. It's, a, it's part of the Chumash um, reservation. I think it's an Indian tribe. So it's something that's very near and dear to the indigenous people as well. So we also, that's one of the programs we're also a part of. And here's a little bit more about the 30 by 30 in the USA. So part of that 30 by 30 is the Chumash National Marine Sanctuary, as well as protecting other MPAs. Because the more MPAs we have, the more reefs that are protected, the more places we can go dive, the more places we can go and enjoy the ocean and protect habitats. And who doesn't want to be looking at that fish up close and personal than looking at a reef that's devoid of, of any coral or any fish and it's just white and plain and uninteresting um because snorkeling we can make more off a of shark scuba diving than we can killing a shark um because scuba divers expeditions for scuba divers or it's just destination spots for diving is just really really um big right now and just as, as a vacation spot, who doesn't want to go snorkeling on a, on a reef like that? I think it's pretty amazing. Um, so, and then California, we do a lot of marine protected areas in California. There's, if you are a diver or, or into beach, um, beachy areas, you can go to any dive shop in the area and you can say, hey, do you have a map of all the protected areas or, or areas I can see some, some wildlife in the ocean? And they'll give you maps of all, a lot of areas. It just in our area in Orange County, you've got Laguna, you've got Divers Cove in Laguna, you've got Charles Cove in Laguna, you've got Crino del Mar, there's a little reef system there. Um, if you go to Crystal Cove, you can go on a nature walk there down to the beach and you can walk in around the rocks there and you can see um, octopus and seals, uh, snails and sea slugs and all kinds of cool crabs and things like that. So a nature, I grew up in nature. I had a cottage. I watched Mutual of Omaha back in the day when my parents, before National Geographic and just fell in love with nature. So this is right up my alley. And this is why I'm so passionate about it because it's something that, that we gotta save for our future generations that, that we can say, our kids can go in there, our grandchildren can go in there and just experience what we get to experience. Um, and that's why I'm so passionate about this. And this is why I'm on board. And um, here's a diver here, you know, and, and a starfish. And is these are some of the other organizations we work with in community science. We work with the Cal Coast um, and the iNaturalist. That's where we, um, that's an app on your phone. So when we do our beach cleanups, we enter it into the iNaturalist app and they're doing you know, studies of plastic and all the plastics that are in the ocean. We, we reach a lot of our students, a lot of our kids, a lot of our families through our beach cleanups. That's our on-site, easy, um, not so easy, but it's a way to connect with the general public. Doing a beach cleanup is it's the easiest way to make an impact because you know you're doing something good for the environment when you can pick up a bunch of plastic before it reaches the ocean or, or a bunch of trash because whatever goes in the ocean is gonna break down because it is salt water, there's sun, there's all kinds of things and the creatures of the ocean are gonna eat it. And when they eat plastic, when they, when they ingest things like that, they don't have the digestive tract that we do. I mean, if you ate a bunch of plastic, you, your digestive tract would be severely affected as well. And a lot of these creatures just die because they're, they're so 
full of plastic that they just can't digest anything else. And it's really sad. And, we, and we're the only person who can do something about it. Humans are the ones creating it. We're the, we should be the ones cleaning it up. And then we have Hawaii. Hawaii is, is a great um, island. It has lots of sharks and they got tiger sharks. They have this big oceanic shark. And so David has actually been to Hawaii three times over 2021 and into 2022 when uh, COVID allowed him to go over there. And we've done some tagging of tiger sharks down there. We have the ID with the QR code of, of tiger sharks down there. So he's worked closely down there with the tiger sharks and implemented some fishing regulations down there while he was there um, over 2021 and 2022, earlier in 2022. And then, uh, we also have a manta study that we're doing. You can go on a manta trip and see the great mantas in Socorro in June. Um, that's on our website. If you are a diver or a boater or just a, a I'm not too sure what qualifications you need, but um, you know, that's something. And this is a picture of a manta ray with a scuba diver. And you can see, I don't know, a bunch of, that's at night. So those are probably just little, fish and stuff and the manta ray is just swimming right underneath them which is pretty darn cool um, that's one of the bucket list trips i have on my list and then this is a whale shark this is a picture that actual david took with his camera david has dove with every shark that you can ever imagine including great whites bull sharks and tiger sharks on an often basis um, he just came back from bonaire and was doing a scuba course down there. Um, but these are whale sharks and David took this picture up close and personal. And there's two whale sharks here and they're just kind of swimming around the ocean, surfacing, getting some, some looky at the surface and little fish down there. And then you have a little tagger on there. That's one of those fish that actually clean the shark of all the parasites. And they just hang out there and they get to do a service for the shark. And these are the big island tigers. So David has a little video here. I'm gonna press it and we can see some tiger sharks swimming around the ocean. And I think David actually took this himself. <clears throat> it's only two minutes. That would be scary, him like swimming right up like that. You can tell it's a shark by the way it moves his tail back and forth like that. That's, uh, Lor I think her name is uh, Lorraine. She's really fat. So David has this pattern ID that they were doing in, in uh, the Big Island to identify tiger sharks. That was close. <laughs> and those looked like dolphins right beside the, the shark. And you see the dolphin tail goes totally different than a shark tail. <clears throat> So they can coexist together, which is kind of cool. So there's some of those pictures that David's been taking in Hawaii. So as I just mentioned, um, let me see if I can pop this forward. I'm going to get out of here.
Uh oh. Uh oh. I'm gonna have to. I might have to manually take me forward. I hope I don't get stuck in this loop. Okay, there we are. So um, just getting out of that video. So this is our pattern ID that we're trying to apply to seven gill sharks in San Diego. So this is, you take a picture and we can download it to the site and it will map the, um, the tiger shark stripes and every shark has a different stripe. It's kind of like a zebra. So every zebra has a different stripe pattern. So do, so do tiger sharks. So this is Laverne. Now Laverne's one of these sharks that's in the area quite a bit. So she's been identified quite a few times by divers and they know she's a local shark and she has a really short fin and she looks really, really fat there. They think she's actually pregnant there. And then they also have a, a number of individuals that they've already identified uh, through this, this um, pattern ID. So we are actually bringing this pattern ID to California to start identifying the seven gill sharks because they have the dots, the, the spots. And pardon me, we could do the same thing with the seven gill sharks. And hopefully with maybe other sharks, if they like leopard sharks and things like that. But, you know, it's everything takes a long time and it takes a lot of volunteers helping out. So, um, but I, th I think it's pretty amazing how many projects David actually has going all at the same time. <laughs> so it takes a lot of volunteers, it takes a lot of engineering and a lot of fo follow up. Um, so the blue shark is one of the other sharks we're trying to protect because um, just like the mako shark, they are threatened. So CITES is the um, organization that you have to appeal to to protect um, any species. So that's why David works internationally as well as locally, because there's not just local sharks, there's sharks all over the world. And so this is our group of students um, holding out their shark signs and their love of sharks. And the Ocean Film Festival is another area where we, um, we are, have a presence and where David volunteers and we get a lot of sponsorship from them and they showcase a lot of ocean films by young people like this, the next generation. Uh, you enter a short clip of your film and they give awards out. So that's another great area where you can go and, and show your ocean lab and support. So basically for Shark Stewards, uh, helping us save shark is our mission. You can donate, donate, you can support our work that way. You can buy our bling on the website. We have t-shirts, we have hats, we have, um, bunch of other things. Uh, David has a book that he just wrote and I'll show you that next. You can volunteer. We're always uh, wanting beach uh, cleanup volunteers, social media, fundraising, writing grants, anything like that. Um, and just become an advocate where you live, you know, talk up the shark and just tell people, you know, sharks, yeah, they may look mean and, and scary like a Doberman or a Rottweiler, but you know they're very integral to our, our health and the ocean health. Um, so spread the word, right? Uh, join an expedition, sign our petitions and help out wherever you can. So that's our website at the bottom, sharkstewards.org. It's pretty easy to remember. And um, this is David's book. It's got Sharks for Kids, a genius scientist guide. And it's got a lot of information there about sharks. I wouldn't call it a sharks for kids book because I'm a big kid and there's so many facts in there, so many scientific names that I think is for every adult out there that loves sharks, every adult that wants to read a book to a kid and for those kids that are just crazy about sharks. And he actually is working on another book about mantas or about rays and skates. Um, so that is due to come out maybe next year or late this year. Um, you can also get that on the website. And then um, there it is. Get yours at sharkstairs.org. He's got these little uh, embedded stuff in here, which is pretty cool. Um, and then lastly, we'd like to thank Hillary once again for having us and be able to show our love of sharks and, and tell you a little bit about Shark Stairs and what we do. And we wanna uh, obviously shout out some of our sponsors. Lush Cosmetics is our major sponsor that usually sponsors us every year. 
Patagonia, the Cal California Academy of Sciences, um, NOAA, we work closely with them, National Geographic, and the Earth Island Institute is our mother company, and they have a lot of nonprofits underneath their umbrella. So we're one of their nonprofits, as well as Plastics Pollutions and a bunch of other uh, nonprofits. So thank you, thank you, Hillary, and thank you everybody out there for listening for this um, length of time and, and being able to tell my story and share my love of sharks and shark stewards. And I uh, hope to see you at a beach cleanup soon. Our beach cleanups are on our Run for Sharks page, runforsharks.org, as well as our race for October and on the Shark Stewards page. So, I mean, if you wanna get everything, just go to sharkstewards.org, okay? And I'm sure Hillary will share some of that information at the end when she does her YouTube or in her video. So thank you again, Hillary. Yeah, thank you so much, Maria. Um, I will be sending out a follow-up email to everyone who's here tonight and everyone that pre-registered for this event. So I'll include in that the Shark Stewards website, um, as well as any additional um, resources or information. So you don't even have to remember the Shark Stewards website. Um, I will be sending that out. We did record tonight, so this will be posted uh, within a couple of weeks on our YouTube channel. So you can, uh, if you want to revisit the talk at that point, I will be sending you that link as soon as it's up. Um, we did have one comment in the chat earlier, and Tori had to log off, but she had asked whether, well, she mentioned that her first introduction to shark conservation was Rob Stewart's film, uh, Shark Water Extinction. And she was wondering if you were familiar with his work, Maria. Oh yes, uh, David knew him. Uh, David knew him very well and knows his family. And unfortunately he died in a diving accident um, shortly after his film was done or actually in the middle of his film. And his parents actually got that film out and his sister was in the film as well. Um, yeah, that's a great film. David um, shows it sometimes at some of his talks, uh, depending on the talk he's giving, um, because he really, really did highlight the shark fin trade and the horrible practice of shark finning and really got it into mainstream media and really put it in front of the public. And um, in that film, he interviews this, they actually got on a boat with this guy called Mark the Shark down in Florida. And his job is, his actual business is hunting sharks. Mm. And they actually went undercover and, and got on his boat and pretended they were um, hunting for sharks. And he did part of his documentary with this guy. And I guess he just wanted the glory and fame of being on, in a film. But um, his sister actually is crying in one of um, the the um, clips because he he lands a hammerhead shark and it takes him two hours or something to land this shark and by the time he lets it go it's so compromised that it can barely swim away mm. um so yeah he's he he was a super cool guy and he he really brought the shark fin trade in front of the public and and did a great service for the sharks because um mm. And because of that film, you know, a, a lot of people know about shark finning and, and the horrible practice that it is. So he's to be given a lot of credit. Yeah, great. Um, Tori said she thinks that that's free and up on YouTube. So if anyone wanted to check that out, um, I can include that link as well. Um, yeah, I, I believe it is too. Um, and I think every now and then you can find it on Netflix um if you have a membership or you know even animal planet like animal planet a lot of these places i got to actually do a, an episode for animal planet and if you google it you can find certain episodes of a lot of stuff now because you know because we are a lot of internet based now and have a lot of youtube channels out there a lot of these companies and news agencies or, or just companies in general have their old episodes on tape somewhere and you can use if you're savvy enough to find it you can you can find it so good luck Tori yeah or thank you Tori for bringing that up yeah um but we didn't have the only 
there were just other comments in the chat, um, people mentioning that they hadn't heard about blue carbon capture or um, that they need to do some more research on that. Uh, you can definitely contact David and find out more, I'm sure. Um, and I just want to say, Maria, that I know you mentioned a couple of times that he could do a, a better job explaining something, but I personally learned so much tonight, uh, so much that I didn't know about sharks. Um, so thank you so much for being here. Uh, I, I wish we could have had uh, met David as well tonight, but we will try and get him back. Um, and hopefully uh, he'll be able to join us next time. But uh, I'm getting agreement in the chat that <laughs> Others agree that you taught us so much, Maria. So well, great. Well, thank you very much because that that is uh, that makes me feel good, <laughs> and and it, you know, I know I have a, a a lot of work to do in myself because I'm I'm still learning myself. So, uh, and this is great for me because every time I do something like this, I get to practice, I get to learn a little bit more myself, and I get to really um, share with everybody um, the new passion and the new purpose I have in life. So. Um, survival is great and it, and it sometimes pushes you in a different direction but um i'm having fun doing it and i'm i'm discovering a whole new um you know scuba diving and a, a whole new uh area that i never knew anything about so it, yeah, it's pretty amazing did you know anything about sharks before your shark bite very limited very limited i'm i'm like i didn't know number one that there is like so many sharks just in california or you know and, th and that they're around the whole like every ocean ecosystem has a shark you know from the depths of the ocean like deep down in five thousand feet down there's a shark and and then you know and the, that skates and rays and just these these animals that you think are are just a whole different species are part of the shark family so um yeah it's pretty cool because being a nature person from a young age and learning all about zebras and elephants and rhinos and and you know all the land creatures to go in the ocean and now discover all these ocean creatures that i never knew about before is is it's mind-boggling really yeah and fascinating yeah it really is well, thank you again so much for sharing your passion with us, for sharing your story with us. Uh, again, everyone that's here, we will be having another Naturalist Night next month, second Thursday of April, also at 6 p.m. And that one will be on climate action. So if you're interested in that, stay tuned. I will be sending out that link as well with my follow-up email. And I hope you'll join us then. And thank you again, Maria. All right, thank you again, Hillary, and thank you everybody out there that, that, that took the time to listen and learn and um, hope to meet some of you soon. And uh, maybe I'll join you on that next talk because it sounds pretty interesting. Great. All right, so shall we sign off? Yeah, have a good night, everybody. Have a great night, everybody. Take care.